Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. COVID-19 fatalities in Indiana's long-term care facilities have more than tripled since the state began collecting information. Ahead, could infections in these facilities be plateauing? School leaders are trying to figure out how to bring students safely back into classrooms. Well, I think schools need to be focusing most on keeping the adults in the building safe. Then you actually need to worry less about the kids. You need to worry about the teachers and the other staff that are in the schools. Coming up, a look at Monroe County's school restart proposal and what the academic year could look like for virtual and in-person learners. Plus, a local teen who has autism is producing his own podcast so other people know it's nothing to be ashamed of. It helps me get more social and helps me make it into the world and interact with strangers. These stories and more right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, in several states, cases of the coronavirus are rising at record high rates, but that's not the case in Indiana. Numbers are trending downward since the peak period in April. A growing number of new cases across the country and in Indiana are among young people. Some of that is likely because more people are being tested. The availability of testing was limited and sicker people and older people were given priority. Now, many less serious cases that would have gone undetected earlier in the outbreak are being confirmed. But Governor Eric Holcomb says it's also because young people are being sloppy. That shift to the younger generation, those folks who are feeling fearless or invincible um, or that they can play right through and nothing bad will happen to them. But the point is it's still affecting the older generation. So we still lost um, too many Hoosiers during this all. 55% of Indiana's positive cases are among people under the age of 50, but 97% of all the state's deaths are among people over the age of 50. Indiana reported 205 more positive COVID-19 cases in long-term care facilities this week. At the end of April, 1,500 Hoosiers in long-term care facilities were infected with COVID-19, but today more than three times that number have been infected. Nearly half of the state's COVID-19 deaths can be traced back to long-term care residents. Further, nearly half of all long-term care facilities have had at least one confirmed case. Uh, housing advocates are calling the state's plan to help thousands of Hoosier renters facing eviction a, quote, good start. Officials announced the creation of a rental assistance program this week that will provide $500 a month for four months to people who've lost income during the pandemic. It's not intended to cover full rent. In Indiana, the median rent is $825. So it's important that the household continue to work with their landlords uh, to make uh, a payment plan to make those payments. The Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition estimates the new program would still leave around 200,000 households without help. Well, with a little over a month until school starts, the Monroe County Community School Corporation has released a tentative plan for getting kids back to school. Parents will be able to choose between in-person or online education, but as Mitch Legan reports, one education policy expert says sending your kids to school might be the best option. Monroe County students haven't been in class since March. Now the school corporation is planning for fall and the coronavirus hasn't gone away. All these great minds are trying to put together a plan that's going to really be safe for our children and our teachers and our staff members to the best of our knowledge, recognizing that until there's a vaccine or until, you know, this thing is eradicated, we're going to have to deal with it. 
When the corporation surveyed parents' thoughts, about 30 percent of respondents said they'd consider keeping their students at home to learn online because of the coronavirus. But for kids 12 and under, data from around the world seem to show that students at schools that have opened aren't spreading the virus. I think it's okay to to say all the evidence points to the fact that they're probably going to be just fine. They're probably not going to get it. If they do, it will probably be very mild. And if they did happen to catch it, the chances of them bringing it back home um, are actually quite low. The CDC reports since February 1st, 28 children, 14 and under, have died of the coronavirus in the U.S. This week, a French study from the Pasteur Institute determined children have not been spreading the virus. Of 510 students studied from six different primary schools, there were just three probable cases of COVID-19. Data from Denmark, Finland and Australia have come to similar conclusions. And at this point, 22 of the European nation nation countries have been back in school for enough weeks that we would have seen, uh, you know, cases start to spike. Haspel notes the science is far from settled on the virus, but the available data point to young children not spreading COVID-19 at school. So how should schools keep people safe? I think schools need to be focusing most on keeping the adults in the building safe. Because if you sort of take this case, the kids aren't likely to get it, and if they're not likely to transmit it, they're not likely to be harmed by it, then you actually need to worry less about the kids. You need to worry about the teachers and the other staff that are in the schools. MCCSC schools are requiring all students and staff to wear masks, and desks will be spaced six feet apart. When possible, teachers and students will remain in groups throughout the day, and teachers will move between rooms to keep students from mingling. Students and staff will be required to self-screen daily for COVID-like symptoms, including a fever of over 100.4 degrees. And pick-up and drop-off times will be staggered to keep adults and children from congregating. We've got over 14,000 employees and people involved in our school corporation. It's not if we're going to have COVID, it's when. It's going to show up. And so do we shut down a single class? Do we shut down a building? Do we shut down the whole corporation? Superintendent DeMuth says the district will work with the local health department when that happens, and schools will close for a period of time. MCCSC officials aren't advocating for one method over the other. They're encouraging feedback and will return next week to make the plan official. Then it's back to school August 5th. Reporter Mitch Legan is in the newsroom right now to talk a little bit more. Mitch, I understand you spoke with IU Public Health biology professor Anna Bento this morning about the data. What did she have to say? Yeah, she says the data is encouraging, but would caution against pointing to them as, you know, sort of like, let's get them all back in school sort of thing, because as encouraging as the data are, they're limited. Uh, Schools around the world were some of the first places to close. So just the opportunity for transmission there was curbed because they weren't open. Uh, She also mentioned that just testing kids in and of itself is a little difficult. And in some of the studies, she'd like to see more students involved, more students tested, more students studied. Uh, She also said we want to be careful just because kids generally transmit coronaviruses very easily. And this is a novel virus. We really don't know anything about it. We're hoping it's going to be closer to SARS or MERS or something like that. It hasn't been. So there's just not enough information out there to make conclusions on how this is spreading. Child to parent, parent to child, that sort of thing. Encouraging, just not enough information there right now, she says. Mitch, one thing that stood out to me was Haspel saying that we might want to really focus on protecting the adults in these schools. What did Bento have to say about that? Yeah, so she agreed, uh, not saying like forget about the kids or anything like that. But if it is parents, if it is adults that are really the ones transmitting this virus, then yeah, absolutely. You know, keep staff members who might be more at risk out of schools, keep teachers from congregating. And she said schools should do a lot of what the MCCSC is already planning on doing mask wearing, social distancing, disinfecting buses and classrooms after use, having specific hand washing times and lots of hand sanitizer available. But she said the big thing is teaching your kids that things are not going to be the same as before. Really drilling that social distancing, not touching your face or friends for that matter for some of these younger kids, that sort of stuff. But again, with all the data that's out there, this is going to be a decision for parents to make whatever they're most comfortable with. All right. Thank you very much. We'll have to wait and see. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you, Joe. Allegations of sexual harassment, racism, and unsafe working conditions are piling up against a local climbing gym. Adam Pinsker speaks with two former employees about why they are compelling their former boss to change his ways. Gabrielle Sanchez Steenberger remembers her first encounter with Hoosier Heights owner Joe Anderson. I was talking about how I was proud of my Latina heritage, and he was heavily encouraging me to be 
as he put it, just as proud of my Caucasian heritage. Sanchez Steenberger, who worked at the Bloomington Climbing Gym from 2017 to 2019, says Anderson began talking about the superiority of certain people's genetic disposition. I have this vivid memory. I asked him, how can you tell who these genetically superior people are? And he said, usually by looking at them. Another former employee, Shelby Porteroff, had a similar conversation with Anderson. Joe touched on the fact that it is just women's biological role and responsibility to have children and that being a parent is the most fulfilling thing in anyone's life. And it's just our responsibility to do that. In addition to racist rhetoric and sexual harassment, Porteroff and Sanchez Steenberger say during their time at Hoosier Heights, they observed unsafe climbing conditions. It's legally required under Indiana state law for all health clubs to have defibrillator systems in their facilities. Um, and those do not exist in Hoosier Heights. The law requiring AEDs in gyms throughout Indiana was passed in 2007. Porteroff recently launched a change.org petition demanding Anderson improve the work culture at Hoosier Heights, which also has locations in Louisville and Carmel. We have also demanded that we receive an apology to the community and the staff for unsafe working conditions and improper treatment. Both Sanchez Steenberger and Porteroff say even though they haven't worked at Hoosier Heights for more than a year, they are passionate about the climbing community. And when I began going back to the gym as not an employee, I was made to feel very isolated and very unwelcome. Reach for Common, Hoosier Heights provided us with this statement. Hoosier Heights Bloomington serves a passionate community of climbers, and we appreciate our employees providing feedback on ways we can improve and better serve our community. Last week, we began announcing several efforts to evolve our company, including changes in leadership, evaluation of policies and procedures, and ways we can improve safety measures. We're also taking into account the current pandemic with a singular focus on health and safety of our employees and members of the Bloomington climbing community. Upon reopening, we will provide more options and opportunities for employee training in areas such as route setting, safety inspection, workplace inclusion, first aid, the use of AEDs, and more. We're very proud of the fact that all employees, salaried and anyone scheduled for shifts, have been and are continuing to be paid during this time. Anderson also posted a message on Hoosier Heights' Facebook page saying in part, Blinded by pride, stubbornness, and misguided opinions, I have said and done things perceived to be offensive. Regardless of my intentions and personal disgust for racism, sexism, and homophobia, I am now beginning to understand that this is not about me and my perspective. Both women say while they are encouraged to read Anderson's comments, they still intend to proceed with the petition until substantial changes are made. This is a way that I can ensure that racism and bigotry and sexual harassment have no place in my community. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Residents along the Lake Michigan coastline are trying to cope with increasing erosion, which is affecting the lives of homeowners, businesses, and the tourism scene in a big way. And an Eastern Green High Schooler has a unique outlet for coping with their autism and it's gaining internet attention. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same. And a panel of award winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing. For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Lawmakers are set to tackle a controversial insurance-related bill during the summer study session. House Bill 1372 would set a universal rate for ambulance transport costs. Adam Pinsker tells us why a lot of county EMS services are against the bill. 
Director of Gibson County's Emergency Medical Services, Jim Allen, does a lot of driving in this rural county of about 33,000 people a half hour north of Evansville. We have one of the largest counties in the state. Which is also home to a Toyota manufacturing plant and two major roadways. We have a lot of car accidents with Highway 41 and I-69. Uh, a lot of the challenges we have is traffic, um, trying to get sometimes to the patients, get them to the hospitals. We can transport up to an hour sometimes with the distance of the county. Allen oversees two dozen paramedics spread across four stations in Princeton, Oakland City, Fort Branch, and Owensville. Each station houses two ambulances. Allen is worried about a proposal that would tie ambulance reimbursement rates to in-network insurance rates. Drastically decrease our revenue because we would not be able to bill the patients and the insurance companies are not even paying us now what we're able to bill. They're only paying a portion of it. So to cut our revenue that much would definitely hurt us financially. Allen says if the bill passes in its current form, the end result could be a tax increase. County revenue has helped pay for Gibson's ambulance maintenance, station upkeep, and personnel wages. Most of Allen's paramedics make about 20 bucks an hour. Allen says the average cost for an ambulance ride in Gibson County is about $1,000 unless the patient has to be transferred to a trauma center. The closest one is in Evansville. We actually have one of the lowest prices in the area as far as ambulance bills. Our prices, we keep them low so we don't have to pass that on to the patient. Is that not better for the employer plan? Ranking member of the Insurance and Financial Institutions Committee, Senator Andy Zay, says the original intention of the proposal was to protect patients from surprise billing, but he says the potential for unintended consequences prompted lawmakers to send the proposal to a summer study committee for closer examination. The offering of services and ambulance services are so um, varied and so diverse it's very difficult in this situation for us to create um, statute that would um, apply well to all the situations. Allen says if these changes aren't made, the county may have to find another jurisdiction or even a private company to handle emergency services, which would end up costing taxpayers more money in the long term and putting Allen and his crew's careers on life support. This could damage, if not eliminate us. I mean, if this were going to go through as it is, we could be out of a job. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. The Owen County Chamber of Commerce is spearheading a fundraiser to build a public restroom facility in downtown Spencer. Although the annual June Pride Fest was postponed until October 17th, community leaders felt the facility is important for the county's festivals and overall economic development since the courthouse was the hub for many of the county's festivals. The chamber hopes to raise $25,000 by July 26th for the project. Erosion along Lake Michigan is pitting neighbor against neighbor in Indiana. While some want to build barriers to protect their property along the lake, others want to block those efforts. As Indiana Public Broadcasting's Rebecca Thiel reports, a lawsuit between two of those neighbors brings up questions about how to protect lakeshore towns and the future of the Lake Michigan shoreline. Back in the 90s, Nancy Schwab's family vacation home in Beverly Shores wasn't as close to Lake Michigan as it is today. She says you would burn your feet on the sand getting to the water in the summer. We used to have another, I would say, 100 to 150 feet of beach going far out to where the waves are starting. Um, and many memories of being out here with the family. This time of year, in late February, Schwab says the ice on the lake used to stretch as far as the eye could see, shielding the shoreline from the harsh winter waves. So much as it's nice to get those 51 degree days, when we have a 51 degree day, my heart stops because I'm like, we're just not getting that protection anymore. Every day, the water inches closer to the road and utility lines in front of her home. Any closer and it will have no heat, no water, and her family won't be able to reach it from the road. That's very sad. It has taken the speech that everybody enjoys. Erosion isn't just affecting homeowners. It could also drive tourists away. Millions visit Indiana's lakeshore every year. In Porter County alone, they contribute more than $350 million to the local economy annually, helping to fund everything from schools to fire departments. The restaurant Wagner's Ribs sits about 10 miles from Schwab's home. Owner Dave Wagner says about a third of his revenue comes from tourists, which is common for small businesses in the area. 
If tourists don't come, Wagner might not need to hire an extra dozen summer workers. He may even have to lay off some full-time employees. Everyone that works here supports themselves off the money they make in this building. The servers, the cooks, all of them. And most of them, this is their main source of income. And if we don't get that summertime push, it will be, people will lose their jobs. Tourism here is closely tied to one of the most unique and sensitive ecosystems in the country. Indiana Dunes became one of the newest national parks last year. The park's chief of resource management, Dan Plath, says overall, Indiana Dunes has been luckier than its neighbors. But if the lake comes up, say, another five feet higher, he says that's going to have a much bigger impact. Uh, we actually have endangered uh, uh, pitcher's thistle, what lives up in the dunes, and if it keeps going, we're probably gonna start getting into an area where we have an endangered species. Other damage is more visible. Erosion collapsed most of the 100-foot walkway built so people with disabilities can enjoy the lakeside view. This round piece of concrete in the water used to be an observation deck. Officials are trying to restore the park's beaches, possibly by dumping sand on the beach or scaling back breakwaters so sand can naturally float to shore. Park Superintendent Paul Labovitz says they might even move buildings back from the lake. Now we haven't decided that yet, but we're, we're, we're thinking that way. We have to get away from Lake Michigan. Building things close to the lake is not a good idea. The question is, will the Great Lakes shoreline get a chance to heal? With climate change, it's hard to say. Carrie Troy of Purdue University researches coastal engineering along Lake Michigan. He says climate change is creating extremes, very high lake levels in some years and very low levels in others. We know that rainfall is increasing over the Great Lakes, uh, so that piece of the lake level budget is definitely increasing. Um, but as temperatures warm, there may be also a tendency for uh, evaporation to increase, and that makes it very difficult to predict which effect is going to outweigh the other. So while we have high lake levels now, Troy says those levels could go down. But I will say that even though the water level can, can recover fairly quickly, um, the coastline cannot. Uh, the coastline will take a long time to kind of rebuild. No less than five Indiana communities have made emergency declarations because of the erosion. One of them is Beverly Shores, where Nancy Schwab's home is. The town has spent more than $300,000 to fix erosion damage, and the town council president says there's no money left. Schwab always planned to retire in the house and someday pass it on to her grandchildren. I'm not going to even think about this house falling into the lake can't go there. So we'll hope for the best. Lakefront communities are hoping the governor will declare a statewide emergency, allowing them to get federal funding to combat erosion. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Rebecca Thiel. A local teen is working to help people become more understanding and accepting of people with autism by sharing his own experience. As Kerma Schultz reports, a podcast he started through school is gaining quite an online following. Gina Mitchell is Sam's mother. She says he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome at the age of four. Like all parents who have a child on the spectrum, she was worried about what that meant for her son. We want to make the right decision with our career and live to and do the best at that job and live the career and have a little fun with it and do that career to the best of our abilities. Sam started his podcast, Autism Rocks and Rolls, back in October, and his mother says it's been great for him. His confidence is definitely much higher now. Um, I think he, he has a I can do it attitude. Sam's interest in podcasts was peaked through his school's media club at Eastern Green High School. His topics range from meltdowns, unexpected changes and how to deal with them, and even making friends. My home for listeners is also to parents to help them understand an autism. Like instead of degrading them in a Walmart, maybe help them instead. He says his goal is to educate and enlighten those with autism and help them overcome their struggles. It helps me get more social and helps me make it into the world and interact with strangers. I mean, I'm the, I'm the type of guy doesn't like to interact with people who I don't know that well. But doing these podcasts, it's making me learn to I got to be the first person to step up. Every single time I get emotional because he is like putting it out there. He is pouring his heart out and 
the whole intent is to help somebody. And I hope to talk to them more about what to do and how to cooperate with this because I do every day. And some days it's not the hard, it's not the easiest thing to do alive. So, but I think I can do it with perseverance and all your support and cherishness. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Karma Schultz. The video game industry is seeing record sales during the pandemic. Sales hit nearly $11 billion for the first quarter of this year. Industry experts say games you can play with other people are the most popular. So I think, you know, games where that relies upon team play, competitive play, co-op play, these types of titles seem to be really thriving because, you know, much like that kind of public place of a playground, it's a meeting spot. As in-person interactions are more limited, time spent playing games has also gone up. Verizon says streamlining games in the U.S. during peak hours has gone up 75 percent since the pandemic began. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.